Hello, Geography 231 students. Welcome to week six of our class. Uh, this week we are talking about mapping density. Um, what does that mean is that exactly? Well, you're going to find out. Uh, it's actually very interesting stuff. Um, it's a way of visualizing data, uh, not just on a map, but looking more about uh, patterns and relationships in, in space. Uh, so, but before I get into that, uh, just a quick announcement. If you've been following through on your syllabus, you know that we have um, we've got an assignment coming up in two weeks. Your project proposal. So, one of the uh, requisites for the class is a semester-long project, um, and the project itself isn't due till the end of the semester. But you have a proposal that is due on October 11th. So the proposal, this is what's in your syllabus. Um, just read this real quick. So students will apply the knowledge and techniques they've acquired in this class to a final GIS map project, the, the proposal for which is due to end of the seventh week of class. Uh, no map topic is off limits, but students are encouraged to discuss the topic with the instructor, be instructor before proceeding. Um, I've already actually spoken to a few of you. If anyone else has any questions or wants to bounce ideas off me or kind of pick my brain, I'm happy to do that, obviously during our, our Zoom hours on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, but for a little bit more information, I actually posted the assignment description, the full description on Canvas. So if you go to Canvas, the home page, uh, obviously it defaults to the syllabus, but then on the left-hand side, you just click on assignments. I know, I know most of you might be using the modules, which is great, but if you just click on assignments, that tells you all the assignments that we have uh, coming up over the course of the whole semester. Uh, and you'll notice underneath uh, your weekly assignments, you also have now a semester map project assignment group. Um, and so the other two have not been added to a mod, sorry, the other three have not been added to a, mo a module yet, but uh, the semester map project proposal assignment has been added to the week seven module. Um, that's because that's when it's due. Uh, but you can access it anytime by going to assignments and finding it there because you can't actually get into week seven yet. So um, go to your assignments, pull up the proposal, read, a, read about it, uh, send me emails if you have any questions. But basically the key thing I want to highlight right now is just that uh, the proposal pr uh, serves as a potential roadmap for students to work towards their completing their final uh, project. So it's not that doing a proposal means that you're locked in and you've signed a contract. If you change your mind and want to do another topic, you're welcome to do that. Obviously, I would discourage that just because you, you're going to have to do some initial research to do your proposal, and so you don't want that to work to be in vain. So uh, think about it you know, before you choose your topic. But basically, I have a handful of questions here, and I encourage you to answer some of these questions, as many as you can, obviously. Uh, you don't have to hit them all, but as many as you can. So what is the topic of your map? Uh, can your topic be summarized in a few sentences? If not, you may want to reconsider. So the reason I have that is that oftentimes students will come to me with a very broad topic, and I always tell them to narrow it down. If you can't tell me in one or two sentences what you're studying specifically, then you just need to fine tune it a bit more. Um, so what objective or purpose will your map serve? What story do you want to tell? Uh, what is the value of your map? Uh, what sort of data will this contribute to the world? What information will it contribute to the world? Um, what data are needed for the project and you may not know exactly what data sources but at least this gives you gives you a chance to start to brainstorm about topics and potential data sources if you can but at least start to think about is this like going to be raster data or vector data uh, numerical data is it going to be primary data secondary tertiary that sort of thing um, what data are needed for the project what kinds of analyses will your project require and this one students don't often know uh, you may not know what analyses you need but again, this is a time for you to sort of ask those questions. Um, let's see, uh, can I manage the topic in a semester? So try not to go, don't shoot for the moon, but don't you know, just throw some names on a, on a map, right? So the goal is to try to find a project that's, um, that you can do in a relatively short period of time, basically uh, two and a half months, right? Between now and the end of the semester, less than that. Uh, and finally, what questions do you have? So be as specific as possible uh, so that you're so that you can answer these questions over the course of your research. So think about questions you have both in terms of your research question itself, the you know, hypothesis or thesis statement, and also questions about like the logistics, like what data do I need? What uh, types of geoprocessing tools might I use? Stuff like that. So um, the proposal is a time to ask questions, partly for yourself and partly for me, because if I see those questions as I'm grading, I can hopefully offer you some some feedback. And once again, just to reiterate, no topic is off limits, but your topic must have a spatial perspective or spatial component. Uh, so uh, what I always tell students 
and what I already have told a couple of students is that choose a topic that you find interesting. Don't necessarily go for the thing that you think is most academically uh, rigorous necessarily. If there is an academic rigor, that's great. But ultimately the goal is to choose something that you find interesting because uh, this is a 231 class. Um, you could carry this on to 232. Likewise, if you're coming from 230, you might want to just keep working and digging deeper into the topic that you, you started in 230. So keep that in mind. Um, as I said, please consult with me if you have any questions. You don't necessarily have to. Uh, papers two to three pages long. You know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. For it's actually on the short side for proposal, um, and you submit it via Turnitin.com. Okay, uh, so that's basically it. Um, I just want to get that out of the way before I move on to the actual lecture for this week. Okay, so this week's lecture topic, as I said, is mapping density. Um, we will be getting into uh, making spatial decisions using ArcGIS Pro workbook. Um, this is the other assigned uh, text for the class, and we'll be using it uh, intermittently from now until the end of the semester. Um, this week is Module 3, Part 1. Next week we're going to stay on the mapping density theme, and then you'll be doing uh, Module 3, Part 2. So upon completion of this lecture in lab, you should understand why and how to map density different ways of mapping density in GIS, how to use a spatial analyst extension, how to generate tessellated hexagonal polygons, and how to publish a story map to ArcGIS online. So these are all uh, those are all tasks that you'll be doing in the, um, the lab. All right, so what is density? It's a term that I guarantee everybody's heard before in some context. So in physics and chemistry, density is defined as the mass of a unit volume of a material substance. All right, so essentially density is uh, the mass divided by the volume. You can just think about that in terms of, you know, the, the forms that water takes, right? So uh, high density would be ice, slightly less dense would be water, and the lowest density of water, excuse me, I should say of liquid water, the lowest density would be steam, all right? So um, density is involved in the atmosphere when we talk about uh, the weather, right? So high pressure, low pressure systems. Uh, density of particulate matter, like PM 2.5 or PM 10, but ultimately density is just the amount of uh, material in a finite, the mass of the material in a finite space, in a volume. Okay. In geography, the concept is is actually fairly si uh, similar, right? Uh, it's not it's not just a borrowed term. It actually has a very similar meaning, and that is um, the density is the measurement of objects per unit area. And in this case, in geography, we're generally talking about area as opposed to volume, although there are ways to calculate volume geographically as well. But ultimately, if you were to kind of import that uh, D equals M over V uh, into a geographic context, it would be D equals N over A, where dens uh, D is density, N is a number of objects or events, and A is area. Um, so these maps here on the right, or the map on the right, excuse me, is uh, persons per square kilometer in Orange County, and that's at the block level. So um, N in this case would be the number of people, and A would be, um, in this case, specifically square kilometers. Now you can map density by any unit you want, generally speaking, square miles, square meters, square feet. Um, but in this case here, we went with square kilometers, partly because a kilometer is smaller than a, a square mile, uh, and you don't want to have such a massive geographic unit that the persons within it is astronomically large. So even a square kilometer is... Uh, is actually a pretty large unit for Orange County because Orange County has over 3.2 million people in an area of only uh, only 800 square miles. So it's a very densely populated county. Okay, so moving moving on. So ways of measuring density. Density is not limited to persons per aerial unit. You can also uh, measure other things. So any physical object on the landscape may be counted or measured, uh, then divided into aerial units. So my examples here are maybe houses, houses per square kilometer, uh, houses per square mile, houses per block, um, cars, maybe cars per parking lot, cars per parking space, should be a one-to-one, -one, right? Uh, trees, so trees per acre, tigers, maybe in a, a nature preserve, tigers per square kilometer, whatever, <laughs> squirrels per tree, uh, cell phone towers per block, skin cells per square inch, uh, galaxies per <laughs> cubic gigaparsec. I just like to throw that one out there. So likewise, um, aerial units are not limited to miles or kilometers. You can use other 
measurements as well. Square feet, square inches, acres, hectares, square plank length. I just, that's just a joke. So it's cubic gigaparks. Um, but at any rate, I have an example here on the right hand side that should be visible to anybody as a, a soccer field or a soccer pitch. So the quiz here for you is what is the density of soccer players on the soccer pitch? Well, so we know what our units are that we're going to be counting soccer players, and we know what our aerial unit is, uh, one soccer field. So the answer is, all you have to do is count them up. If you know soccer, you know there's 11 players per team, two teams, that's 22. So 22 players per soccer pitch. You could look at it other ways too. How many players per team? 11 per team. Or how many per half? Uh, 11 per half. So ultimately you just need to have that numerator, that denominator, and that will give you density. All right, so when it comes to measuring density on the landscape, there are actually um, at least three different ways of doing that. You're not limited to just simply arithmetic, which is the first one here. Arithmetic density is total number of people divided by some area. Okay, the map here on the right is persons per square kilometer, and that's on the national level. Other ways of measuring density might be physiological density. Physiological density is the number of people supported by unit of arable land. So you're going to get a really different uh, outlook if you compare these two, arithmetic versus ph uh, physiological, because the uh, denominator in this case is uh, arable land instead of total land. So if you've got a country like, um, let's see, what's one that's drastically different? France, for example. Uh, France has a fairly high density of persons per square kilometer, but its persons per kilometer of arable land is actually fairly low, right? Only 500 people per uh per kilometer of arable land. So the reason is that uh, France has a pretty um, pretty fertile landscape. Okay, there's a lot of arable land there. Um, on the more extreme end, I would like to point out uh, Egypt. So Egypt has over 2,000 people per kilometer of arable land. And you, if you know anything about your geography, you probably know why, right? The vast majority of arable land in Egypt is right along the Nile River Valley and the, uh, the Nile River Delta as well. So you've got um, you know, tens of millions of people in Egypt, uh, and the only av available arable land is right there along that strip. Um, let's see, another good example might be uh, Papua New Guinea, very similar situation uh, uh, as uh, Egypt, where there are quite a few people, um, but not a lot of arable land. Uh, whereas if you look at its arithmetic density, uh, same number of people, but a lot of land total, therefore it's got a fairly low density. Uh, finally, we've got, I would say, the most unique measurement uh, system or method, and that's uh, agricultural density. Agricultural density is a ratio of the number of farmers to the amount of arable land. So instead of taking the total uh, population divided by square kilometers of arable land, it's just the total number of farmers divided by uh, square kilometers of arable land. Uh, so we, to, to calculate this, you divide population of farmers by arable land units. Right. So in this case, you get a really different looking map. You end up with uh, more more uh, rural countries, countries that rely primarily on uh, farming for economic activity and uh, food growth uh, to have very high um, farmers per kilometer of arable land. So what that means is that they actually have, um, in theory, a greater potential for food growth. Right. Potential, because obviously there are other factors involved, infrastructure, access to seeds, things like that. So a lot of sub-Saharan Africa actually has a lot of farmers relative to the amount of arable land. Now, other issues with that is that um, you may have more farmers than you have farms, right? So if you end up with that, then you end up with a, a higher unemployment, uh, right? It's gonna end up affecting the economy. So you wanna find a, a nice balance there. But um, it's interesting to look at the United States, how despite the US having tons and tons of arable land, tons and tons of uh, square miles, hundreds and hundred, thousands, hundreds of thousands of square miles of uh, arable land, we don't necessarily have uh, that many farmers to farm it. But in reality, we have what's known as commercial farming in the United States and more developed countries rely on commercial farming where uh, we use you know, a mechanization to harvest food, plant seeds, harvest food and stuff like that. So, okay, moving on. Why map density? Why do we even do it? Well, we map density uh, in order to identify patterns on the landscape. That's the ultimate goal, right? So density maps are useful for identifying patterns on the landscape. Uh, beyond simply showing where objects exist, density maps allow the viewer to compare the amount of objects within an area. So this here, this example on the right, is uh, burglaries at the county level in Texas, 2002. So if you were to look at just the uh, 
you know, the, the actual events of burglaries, they'd be spread out over the over the state. But if you're able to see density, those uh, areas with a higher number of uh, burglaries in one location, those then pop out on a density map. Um, other examples, so for example, a crime analyst might map the density of burglaries occurring over uh, over a year per square mile to compare different parts of the city. Additionally, one might compare crime density year over year to see where crime prevalence has changed over time. So this data is from 2002, it might be interesting to compare it to 2010 and 2020 data as well, because then you can look at uh, crime density over uh, as it changes over time. It's very useful. Okay. So mapping density is useful for comparing areas of different size as well. Um, events occurring in two different locations might have the same number of instances, but the impact differs based on the size of the area in which the events occur. So before I get into the examples real here, right here, because they're fairly specific, I just want to go back to the idea of um, farmers, right? So if you've got, we'll say, a thousand farmers in a country of uh, 10 million people, it's not going to be enough to feed the population, right? If you've got a thousand farmers in a country of a million people, then that ratio goes up. So you've got the same population, but the the, um, de no, the denominator is is different, right? So it's all about uh, scale at that level. Okay, so uh, consider positive cases of COVID-19. In this case here, this is data real recent, like yesterday, uh, from the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, website that tracks COVID cases in the U.S. Um, if you look at the data, you can see that both San Bernardino County and Orange County have got almost identical numbers of confirmed cases, which is you know, just a coincidence. Um, but uh, in the case of San Bernardino County, those 52,000 cases are, are, in theory, spread out over a much larger area, an area that's 25 times the size of Orange County. Now, I've got a caveat here. In reality, most people in San Bernardino County are clu clustered in the southwest corner. But in theory, if all these cases were spread out equally or um, they had a, a, a regular distribution across the county, then your chances of encountering someone with COVID-19 are lower because people are they're, they're farther spread out, right? Um, and so 52,000 cases evenly spread out over 20,105 square miles. And there's a square, square. Um, and that's the actual size of San Bernardino County, over 20,000 square miles. And in, yes, San Bernardino County is the largest county in the country by area. So 52,000 cases over 20,000 square miles comes out to 2.6 cases per square mile. All right, so your chances of encountering someone in San Bernardino County, if everyone were evenly distributed, would be very low. Uh, if you look at Orange County, 52,000 cases, actually 52,382, uh, spread out over only 800 miles, comes out to 65 cases per square mile. So Orange County is 25 times uh, smaller in area, but actually has a million more people than San Bernardino County. So sick people are more densely populated in Orange County. And that, those are all obviously real numbers. Um, and the, the population distribution in Orange County, it does favor the north, but it's more evenly distributed uh, from north to south. Uh, it's um, Eastern end is actually unpopulated primarily because of Cleveland National Forest. Okay, so mapping density uh, is dynamic because density is scalable. Uh, if your area units, sorry, if your area unit is an entire state or county, you might display density uh, of persons per square mile or per, per square kilometer. If your house, uh, sorry, if your area unit is a classroom or a household, you might want to display density of persons per square foot or square meter. So basically that means that depending on what your numerator is, you can always, uh, I'm sorry, you can always change that denominator as well. It just depends on uh, what the scale is. So it, you're not, you're not stuck into uh, persons per square mile. You could do persons per square foot, persons per square uh, kilom uh, square meter, and what, whatever it is, per every 10, 10 square meters, right? Uh, so it is scalable. So mapping density in GIS, how do we do it? All right, mapping density in GIS. Before mapping density, ask yourself what kind of data do you have and what kind of data do you want to create? That should be the first question that you ask, because that will help you determine uh, the form of the output uh, density map. Okay, so points and lines may be mapped to a defined area. For example, Starbucks locations uh, aggregated by state, so Starbucks locations per state. Um, and that's also, that's the form of density map you've 
created already. So when we did our census data last week and the week before, we were aggregating data at the block group level. All right, so it was persons per block group essentially. And obviously we're looking at other, not just number of people, we're looking at actual data points, uh, but the, the principle applies. Um, <clears throat> another example could be uh, rivers aggregated by state. And those are sort of the examples there on the right. Or uh, points and lines may also be mapped as a raster, raster density surface. Uh, raster surface. For example, uh, cities mapped by density and weighted by population over a raster surface, and that's the example we have here. So the density of the actual number of cities in an area, then you can add in the attribute of population, and that will give you actual population density over the, the whole country. The last example there, rivers mapped by density over a raster surface. Okay, so uh, density within a defined area may be represented uh, in multiple ways. I've just got a screenshot right here of the various ways that you can um, map quantities in ArcGIS Pro, and uh, density is useful for um, graduated colors, uh, graduated symbols, proportional symbols, dot density, and, um, and charts too, but we're not really going to get into charts right now. So Density within a defined area may be represented by dot densities, which we're going to get into, core pleth maps, which you've already created, and graduated symbols. Dot density maps are useful for visualizing the density of individual locations, people, trees, crimes, summarized by a defined area. So I'll show you a bit more on that in a, in a second. But basically, dot density gives you sort of the illusion that every dot represents uh, an event or an object. Now, it is an illusion because you can uh, have one dot represent five things or one thing or two things and also the distribution is um, artificial as well so you'll see a bunch of dots across i uh, will say a census block and you might think every dot represents a person but then you realize that within a census block maybe every household is in the southwest quadrant and the other uh, three quadrants are uninhabited but with the dot density map it distributes those dots evenly regardless of where people are actually located um, choropleth maps are useful for visualizing the density of objects when distribution is not important. And graduated symbols are useful when comparing the relative magnitude of densities across areas. So dot density maps, as I said, useful for visualizing density of individual locations. Uh, also useful for visualizing the relative density of unique values within an attribute field. So on the right hand side, you see that, uh, that's just the visualization of population uh, by a census block around Cypress College. Cypress College is right there in the middle. And you can obviously see the darker black uh, areas have more people, right? It's fair to assume because one dot represents one person. But again, as I was saying, not everybody is um, evenly distributed, right? So some neighborhoods might, uh, well, for example, right here north of the campus, we know that there's housing here along Lincoln. Uh, but here uh, on this side, it's actually part of the campus and it's parking lot. So all the people who live right here along Lincoln have been evenly distributed into the Cypress College uh, campus, right? So that's that's inaccurate. Uh, but down here, uh, as far as I was saying before about the relative density of uh, unique values, every dot represents a, a person of a specific race or ethnicity and i've got a non-hispanic white non-hispanic asian and hispanic population represented there by red blue and yellow respectively and so this is really useful from a census perspective of seeing where uh, various ethnic groups are clustered um, and now in the case of cyprus it's a, a very multicultural multi-ethnic city right and obviously we've got cyprus here on the left buena park to the, sorry i should say on the to the west buena park to the north Anaheim to the east. Uh, and so just visualizing it, you can kind of see that there seems to be uh, like a fairly large Asian cluster just to the northeast of the campus. Uh, to the west, there's more red, so more non-Hispanic white and non-Hispanic Asian. And then to the east in Anaheim, we have a higher density of a Hispanic. Uh, then this little section right through here seems to be primarily Hispanic, Asian, and white. So there's definitely a multi-ethnic uh, feel there. But just know that uh, this is useful when you've got various attributes that you want to be able to compare, you know, side by side or on, on top of one another. Next up, we have graduated colors, uh, also known as a choropleth map symbology. And choropleth mapping is what you've actually already been doing in class. Choropleth maps are useful for visualizing density of objects when the distribution is not so important. So you don't necessarily need to visualize the actual person on the ground, right? Um, it's also useful for visualizing 
the relative density of unique values within an attribute field. So uh, in the first example here, we've just got persons per, school, per square kilometer at the block level. Okay, so we can still make a density sort of at the, the grand neighborhood level. Uh, and then down here, what I have is occupancy rate. So what that is, is a total occupied units divided by the, the occupied units divided by the total number of units. So that helps you visualize what is the household occupancy rate around Cypress College. So you're not just looking at um, density, you're actually taking two different uh, attribute fields and then uh, dividing one by the other. Okay, uh, so that's that's good to know that uh, to the north of Cyprus College and a little bit to the northeast, you've got some uh, below 92% occupancy rate, meaning that there are more open houses, essentially, uh, or vacant houses, uh, whereas to the, to the west and the southwest, it looks like the most houses are above 98%. Um, occupied. Okay, so that's just kind of an interesting data point. Not so useful necessarily in our area, but um, like looking at coastal housing, I always find that interesting because there are so many um, unoccupied coastal houses because they tend to be um, vacation rentals or vacation uh, vacation homes for people. So they're not their primary residences. Uh, and lastly, we have graduated symbols. So graduated symbols are useful when comparing the relative magnitude, uh, a relative magnitude across areas. So this is once again, um, this is vacancy rates. So instead of occupancy rates, it's like the opposite. Instead of occupancy, it's vacancy. Uh, and so most houses have a fairly low vacant, or most blocks have a relatively low vacancy rate, right? Uh, but there are, uh, there's this area here to the northeast of uh, Cypress College that's got very high vacancy. So that could be a new development, perhaps. Maybe new homes that were built and no, no one's moved in yet. Well, who knows? Just theorizing. All right. All right. So mapping density by raster surface. This is another way to map density. So, so far we've been talking about uh, more or less vector data. So polygons that display densities, basically taking you know, the total number of objects divided by the total area. Mapping density by raster surface is uh, it's a very different process. Uh, and in some ways, it's uh, more useful in terms of showing actual distribution of the objects. But in other ways, it's a little more challenging because it's uh, harder to come up with a specific finite uh, number, numerical value for a whole area, because every single raster cell, which I'll explain in a moment, every single raster cell represents an individual value. Okay, so when we're talking about mapping area by density, uh, by defined area, it's easy to find out how many objects are in that space, all right? When it comes to mapping density by raster, every single cell has a different value. So Let's get into it. Okay, so a density surface is created in GIS as a raster layer. Raster data has no distinct shape or area. So you can have a raster that is rectangular, circular, shaped uh, by some sort of mask. So when we talk about masks, essentially it's like a cookie cutter. So let's say you want to have a raster that shows uh, the depth of the Grand Canyon. If you set a mask, which is uh, set as the perimeter of the Grand Canyon, then your output raster will be shaped as the Grand Canyon in that um, that mask is essentially like a cookie cutter that uh, cuts out the cells that are within that, those boundaries. Okay, so raster data has no distinct shape or area. Rather, raster data are grids of measured values. So you can see here on the right, uh, essentially that's, that's the model of a raster. You've got rows and columns, and every single cell or pixel within there, uh, it coincides with um, some column and some row and every cell has a numerical value. Numerical values on a raster can be anything. They can be elevation, they can be rainfall numbers, they could be, uh, in this case here, density values, all right? So they can be any sort of number, but all it is is one single number, okay? So raster surface is a grid or a matrix of identically sized cells. Each cell represents a unit of surface area and a measured or estimated value for that location. That's another thing too. When it comes to rasters, it's not just all actual measured values. You can also interpolate what is uh, what the value might be at a given location based off of some of uh, some other known values. So if you've got a handful, say like ten uh, measurement locations, well, let's use um, uh, weather stations in California. Let's say there's ten stations across Southern California. What you can do is take those actual known values and then interpolate, which is essentially predict what the values are in between those locations uh, through various their various interpolation processes uh, in raster analysis. Uh, 
Uh, so data are displayed using gradients to show change from location to location. And those gradients are essentially color gradients. They can be from light to dark, they can be red to blue, or yellow to red. In this case here on the bottom right, we've got light green to white, essentially, where light green represents a low elevation, dark green slightly higher, those oranges and browns higher, and then in the bottom left, you can see white, and that represents the highest, highest elevation. So density functions count occurrences within a given search radius and then divide by that area. So one of the key things when it comes to creating a raster surface, a density surface rather, is to set a defined search radius around every um, event, every measured point. Okay. So based off of how far that distance is, that will increase or decrease the density uh, around any given known location. So density tools calculate the density of input features within a neighborhood around each output raster cell. And that's the term we use in raster analysis is neighborhoods. A neighborhood essentially is the defined radius around any given location. So density is a function of uh, known value, known numbers or objects uh, divided by area. So it's the same as when you're using a, a vector data set, a known area, uh, but in this case you have to set the search radius instead of using, you know, sets as blocks or tracks or you know, whatever it may be, counties. Uh, so for density maps, a specified search area determines the distance to search for sample locations, and this can be lines or points. So as I said before, a large search area leads to a smaller density or a lower density, excuse me, and a small search area leads to a, a higher density, okay? And that's because it's all about number of objects divided by area. And that's not necessarily always true if there happen to be a huge number of objects evenly distributed out. But generally speaking, uh, events or objects tend to cluster. And so if you have a small search radius around a cluster, then it's going to lead to a higher density. If your cluster remains the same, but you include a, a larger search radius, then that density goes down because you have a larger uh, denominator, essentially search area. So density surfaces can be calculated via three methods, uh, point density, line density, and kernel density. Uh, point and line are actually the same method, it's just different inputs, okay? Uh, point, uh, point, see, simple point density calculates the magnitude per unit uh, area around each cell, okay? So points, obviously, in this case, they coincide with cells or specific uh, matrix locations. Line density calculates a magnitude per unit area within a radius around each cell. So again, same thing, right? So it's all about a search radius or a neighborhood, okay? Kernel density calculates a magnitude per unit area from a pointer polygon using a kernel function to fit a smooth tapered surface to each point or line. So essentially what it does is it, it extends out that density over the defined surface, and that, help, that helps lead to a more a smoother surface, okay? So when it comes to kernel density, um, instead of just having uh, 10 objects in a location and then having um, essentially that density just showing up where that location, uh, the, the density of the objects are, kernel helps smooth out that number, that numerator, over whatever the defined area is. Uh, so in that case, it might end up looking like there are um, objects out on the periphery when in reality they're all clustered but because we've set a kernel uh, distance farther than the cluster that's located there it ends up smoothing out the data and visually pushing out all those objects to the periphery um, so that they, you're still going to see the density in the middle where the the bulk of that cluster is but uh, you might have completely an area completely absent of any objects out on the periphery, but it still looks like there are some. Essentially, it takes what might be a volcano and pushes it down to like a flat, more or less a flat surface with just a minor bump in the middle. So point and line density tools calculate a magnitude per unit area from the input features that fall within a neighborhood. So we talked about that before. A neighborhood is essentially the search radius around the object, around the cell. A neighborhood is defined around each raster cell center, and the number of points that fall within that neighborhood is totaled, then divided by the area of the neighborhood. So if that search radius is 50 kilometers, uh, so then it's going to do a 50 kilometer radius around, you're going to get one density. If that search radius is 100 kilometers, you're going to end up with essentially being uh, half as dense in any given location. Okay, so neighborhood size helps determine the density. A larger neighborhood means a lower density and vice versa.
Kernel density calculates a magnitude per unit area from a point or line feature using a kernel function, as I mentioned before. Kernel density spreads the known quantities of the population for each point out from the point, the point location. And again, the resulting surface surrounding each point is a kernel density uh, based off of a quadratic formula with the highest value at the center. And then the farther out you go, it tapers down to zero when you finally get out to the very end of that search radius. But if you're, we'll say, some distance from the edge, we'll say five kilometers out from the edge in a hundred, a hundred kilometer radius, you're still going to visually see some density out there, even if there aren't objects in that location. And that's the goal of, of kernel density. It's to sort of smooth out your surface uh, to make it more kind of visually appealing, but also sort of highlight this is, this is the search area. All right. So even if there's nothing out there, you still can see that's part of the search area because visually there's still like in this example on the bottom, there's still some light blue out in this area, even though there are no objects. Uh, next up, we have mapping density by contours. So contour lines uh, are essentially lines on a map that connect points of equal value. Uh, you can create contour lines from uh, a raster data set. OK, you can also create it from a point data set and probably even from a line data set. I've never actually tried that, but certainly from points and from rasters. What they do is they, end, they essentially uh, create a, a data set of what we call ISO lines. OK, so contour lines and ISO lines are the same. And as I said, every single ISO line or contour line represents uh, one single point of um, elevation or some other numerical value. It could be temperature. So every location within this ISO line area has the same temperature, precipitation, uh, pollution values, atmospheric pressure, something like that. So essentially with a raster data set with a density surface, um, every single cell represents a uh, value, right? Some sort of number. Well, what rasters do is it virtually connects all of the like numbers, all the numbers that are the same on a line, okay? So the distribution of lines shows how the values change across a surface. And also a good thing about this is that um, you're converting from raster data back to vector data and vector data tends to be uh, more agile, smaller in size, uh, easier to, to save and to, to render on screen. Um, so once you have these, these vector lines on screen, essentially what you're looking at is those that are spaced farther apart that represents a, um, a shallower change in elevation from from location to location. So if you have two ISO lines that are, we'll say, this far apart, then the difference between the two is at a fairly shallow angle. If you have two lines that are about this far apart, then the difference is much steeper. OK, so where there is little change in, in values, the lines are spaced apart. Where values rise and fall rapidly, lines tend to be closer together. So on this example here, obviously this raster was used to create this contour data set. And you can see in the raster right here through the center, this light green area tells you that it's primarily flat and low. OK, and so how does flat and low translate to contour lines? Well, it looks like this. So down here through the center, we see that the lines are fairly far, uh, far apart. And then you move up to the edge of this sort of canyon um, or you know, valley, and you can see the lines get much closer together. And then they're very close together up at the, the mountain peaks because there's the most change uh, in that area. OK, so that's that's how contour lines work. All right, uh, last method I'm just going to mention here are our tessellated grids. So a tessellation is essentially um, a repetition of some sort of geometric feature. So a repetition of hexagons or triangles or squares, um, something like that, diamonds. So uh, perhaps considered a hybrid between defined area polygons, so like using census blocks or tracks uh, in density services, as we just discussed, tessellations offer a third solution to mapping density. A tessellated grid is an aggregation of objects or event points into regularly shaped grids. Uh, so it's it's similar to what we just did in the sense that it's about aggregating uh, to some area, you know, just like when it comes to defined defined location. But it also spreads out the data uh, beyond you know beyond some uh, defined space. So tessellated grids can be, as I said, hexagons, transverse transverse hexagons, squares, diamonds, triangles. And it's useful, if it's a key thing, it's useful for normalizing uh, irregularly shaped geographic units. So this example here on the right, uh, I don't actually even know where this is, it's some location, but you've got uh, obviously a major cluster right here in the center, and then the cluster thins out to the north and to the south, okay? So if you use a tessellated grid, the tessellated grid covers all areas within this location where there are any objects uh, but so essentially you're able to um, very you can sort of preserve the shape 
or the, the, the distribution in a sense, but um, you, you don't actually have any base geographic units there. So maybe these dots are you know on Earth somewhere, but you don't know if they fall within census blocks or census tracts. So we use a tessellated grid essentially to stand in for those defined areas, but in the same way that we use a density surface, you're sort of smoothing out the distribution to fill out this whole defined search location. Okay, um, it's also it's useful for what we call cartograms. Cartograms are are uh, charts that sort of resemble a map. So that's the whole cardo aspect, right? And gram is like like a chart. Uh, and so on the bottom right here, we see a cartogram of the United States. That's the gap between median household income and income needed to afford median priced homes. And as you may expect, California pretty high up there. Hawaii, Oregon. Colorado, DC. And so you can see that there is no real, other than sort of moderately being shaped like the United States, there's no spatial uh, scale here. Like we've got Washington, DC right here, which looks like Appalachia to me, but that's because Maryland, Delaware, Connecticut, and Virginia also get an equally sized tessellated grid cell. Okay. So that's what tessellations are for. I wanted to introduce that concept to you because in this week's uh, lab, you'll be making a tessellated grid to display uh, crime distribution in Washington, D.C. So um, that is essentially what tessellated grids are. It's another useful way to display distribution of density uh, when you don't have necessarily some sort of base geography into which all those units can be aggregated. Um, and at the, same, at the same time, you can kind of make an effort at preserving the shape, but ultimately it's not about spatial accuracy as much as it is um, displaying values, right, or whatever those those densities are, and uh, you can kind of sometimes get a rough estimation of what the area is as well. So I created this uh, comparing density methods chart here, sort of adapted it from uh, a different reading that I have, uh, and essentially breaks it down the four different methods I discussed into um, what the method is, when you might want to use it, what scenario would be appropriate, what the output data set is, and what the pluses and minuses the trade-offs are. Uh, so when it comes to mapping density by a defined area, you'd want to use this if you already have data summarized to that specific area. So census data is the best example that comes to mind because we have census data aggregated to blocks, block groups, tracks, counties, what have you. All right. The output is a core pleth map or a dot density map or graduated symbols. The trade-offs are that it's relatively easy. We've been doing it for several weeks now. Uh, but it does not necessarily pinpoint the exact center of density. Uh, raster surfaces, on the other hand, tend to pinpoint the center of density and then show the, uh, the kind of minimal density along the periphery of the neighborhood. So when it comes to density surfaces, uh, you'd want to use this if you have individual locations, like points or lines. Um, and in this case, obviously, it does help show uh, actual density clusters. The output is a shaded density surface or a contour map, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, gives a more precise view of centers of density, but requires more data processing. So as you probably know, raster data tends to require more processing time, more, more computing power, and more storage space than vector data. Um, you might want to create contour lines in that case. Uh, use this if you have a raster surface displaying density, but you prefer vector data for whatever reason. Maybe uh, you're light on storage space, uh, you need it to render quickly, whatever the need may be. It's just vector data always renders faster and requires less storage space than raster. Um, what's the output? An ISO line feature class or contour line uh, data set, same thing. Uh, Maybe symbolized using a color gradient so it sort of resembles a raster data set with that light to dark or light green to brown, whatever the colors are that sort of symbolize Earth or your, your density. Uh, the trade-offs are that it gives a precise view of centers of density like a raster, but it may require two steps. You have to create the raster first and then the vector data set. Now, obviously there are ways to make vector, uh, ISO lines without raster first. You could actually create it from a point data set, uh, but it, sometimes it may be a two-step process. Lastly, uh, creating a tessellated grid. When would you want to, when would you want to use this? Uh, if you have irregularly shaped geographies or no um, base geographic unit uh, on which to symbolize the data, the output is a tessellation or a tessellated grid, maybe hexagons, inverse hexagons, diamonds, squares, triangles. And the trade-offs are that it results in standardized geographic units, but it loses the shape of the original features. So if you did have irregularly shaped polygons, like we'll say the individual states of the United States, you end up losing the original shape, right? Um, you end up with the example I had where DC is represented as the same size as California, which obviously in the real world, it's not. So those are the, the pluses and minuses there. Um, so that 
concludes this week's lecture. Um, I move on to the tutorial now, or whenever you know, sometime in the next few days if you're starting this early. Uh, just be mindful of the time there. And if you have any questions, feel free to email, send me a message on Canvas, post on the message board. I don't think we've had much message board activity. Um, that's okay. But uh, yeah, so there you go. Have a good week, and we'll be in touch. Bye-bye.